everybody here be able to stay between the lines. And, you know, I definitely welcome questions as we go. If you do have questions during the program, you can feel free to put them in the chat. You know, Brad's going to be monitoring that and you could either put the question in the chat, he could read it to me, or we can have you unmute and ask the question. So please feel free to jump in. I always like to make sure that people are all on the same page in terms of understanding content before getting too far along. And I'll definitely stop at certain points to see if there are any questions. So why are we here today? To discuss the recent changes to New Jersey's campaign finance and pay to play laws. The focus today is really going to be on preserving eligibility for New Jersey government contracting opportunities. I know that probably almost everyone who's in attendance today contracts with government. You're obviously all either politically active or interested in being politically active. And it's always striking that balance and making sure that individuals within the company or the company itself can be politically active without jeopardizing eligibility for government contracting opportunities. And I'm going to wrap up by providing you with some concrete compliance takeaways that you can take back with you to your companies after the program today. Today's program is really going to be a very high level program. Um, a lot of these topics could lend themselves to almost a half a day program in and of themselves, but I'm going to cover political activity, the Election Transparency Act, you know, which is the new law, talk about New Jersey's pay to play restrictions, a little bit about independent expenditure activity, and then wrap up with some strategies for compliance. So to kick it off, what is political activity? This is going to see seem very routine, but I always find it's helpful to make sure we're all starting from the same place. And I think as everyone knows, political activity can take the form of direct political contributions. You write a check, make a credit card payment to a political recipient, in-kind contributions where it's basically you're using resources, facilities, potentially staff time for the benefit of a political recipient. Independent expenditures, when you host a fundraiser, whether that's actually at your company, your home, or you're just asked, can you put your name on this invitation? You know, that is considered political activity. Sponsoring a golf outing. Um, you know, I know the weather has been pretty nice these last few days. We're all getting a taste of spring. And in all the years that I've been doing this, I often find that golf outings have often caused confusion and agitation for many people who are politically active because they're not always thinking about the fact that if you sponsor a hole or sponsor a foursome at a golf outing, even if people are playing golf, if that check is being written to a political recipient, that is a political contribution. And the same holds true with placing an ad in an ad journal for a political event. So these last two bullets here are really, I think, two of the activities that people are not always thinking about as constituting political activity. So really what you wanna think about, in short, just about any time you write a check or provide a benefit to a political recipient, it is political activity. Pay to play restriction. So New Jersey really has been the home to pay to play restrictions for the better part of the last few decades. And prior to April 3rd of 2023, in addition to having three statewide pay to play laws and two pay to play executive orders, as I'm sure many of you know, New Jersey had hundreds of local pay to play ordinances in effect. These ordinances often caused a lot of challenge for those looking to do business with the government because they may have been similar to one another. Sometimes there might be a slight difference. The good news is when Governor Murphy signed the Election Transparency Act into law, which we frequently refer to now as the ETA, it marked the most sweeping changes to New Jersey's campaign finance and pay to play laws in nearly two decades. The ETA has simplified and streamlined New Jersey's pay to play laws. And as you'll hear me mention several times today, there are no more local pay to play ordinances Government contractors do still need to pay careful attention to the law and its requirements, which is especially clear in light of Governor Murphy's Executive Order 333. So I think that when the ETA first passed, a lot of people sort of felt like, okay, pay to play restrictions are going out the window. We don't need to think about this anymore. And that's not true. 
it has become a lot easier. The process has become a lot more streamlined, but pay to play restrictions are still in effect and you do need to pay attention to them if you do business or hope to do business with the New Jersey government. So here are some of the key changes resulting from the passage of the ETA. And I know this program is being recorded and the PowerPoint will be distributed as well. This is a good quick reference slide to keep handy. It's a snapshot of the changes in the law resulting from the ETA. So what this law did is traditional campaign finance limits have doubled and in some cases tripled. You may already have started to see that as you're getting invitations to political events with ticket prices and amounts you haven't seen in a very long time. You know, for example, under traditional campaign finance limits, you know, an individual or a corporation may now give up to $5,200 per election to a non-gubernatorial candidate. In the past, that was $2,600. Um, you know, same holds true with party committees. We're now at a point with county and state party committees where you can give up to $75,000 a calendar year which is really a very big change for several reasons and some of which I'll touch upon in a few slides. The other big change is that the reportable threshold has been reduced from 300 to 200. That's per election to a candidate, per calendar year to a party committee, PAC or legislative leadership committee. So this is really another big change because for decades, 300 was always the magic number if you wanted to remain eligible for government contracting opportunities, if you didn't want to show up on ELAC reports, 300 or less, you were pretty much safe. That's now shifted to 200. So that's something to keep in mind as well. If it's still a goal, you know, that you want to stay non-reportable, you need to now be limiting contributions to 200, not 300. Statewide pay to play restrictions have been streamlined. So the fair and open process now applies at all levels of government, including the executive branch, which is new because under the old law, there was no fair and open exception for executive branch contracts. Local pay to play ordinances have been sunsetted. So the nice part about that is you don't have to deal with all those local variations in pay to play ordinances that may be in effect in counties or municipalities. What you may still be seeing is that municipalities may potentially still be using old pay to play disclosure and certification forms and referencing the local ordinances. Um, I have some recommendations that I'll talk about in a few slides about how to handle that. But I think the key here is it's going to take some time for all of these changes to really be showing up on the different documents that you're probably seeing as part of the procurement process. And the rules around independent expenditure activity and reporting have been expanded. So I will touch upon that as well. Now, what does the term pay to play mean? You know, I've been doing presentations like this for a long time. And I think it was a couple of years ago, I was doing a training for one of my clients, you know, for their in-house business and legal team. And one of the attendees stopped and said, you know, I'm confused. I always thought that pay to play was illegal. Why are you talking about pay to play laws and explaining all the different components of them? You know, so that really was a moment where I thought, you know what, let's just take a step back. So in the world of government contracting, pay to play is generally known as the practice of an individual or business making a political contribution with the hope you could see of quote unquote, buying access for consideration for a government contract. Now, let me be very clear, it is always illegal to make a political contribution with the intent or understanding that the contribution will result in the award of a government contract. However, it is not illegal to participate in the political process without any such intent or understanding. The easiest way that I tend to think about pay to play laws is they're basically laws that are sitting at the intersection of procurement and campaign finance law and they impose reduced contribution limits on contributions by government contractors and certain associated individuals. So whether reduced pay to play limits apply will often depend on whether a contract is being awarded pursuant to a fair and open or non-fair and open process. So you have to pay attention to all of this in figuring out which level of contribution limits apply to you. 
Are you in the world of traditional campaign finance limits because you're not doing business with a particular government entity or you're not interested in doing business with them or because they award everything through a competitive process? Um, in the world of insurance contracts, when they're looking for brokers or risk management services, you generally would fall under the extraordinary unspecifiable exception, which would exempt certain contracts from public bidding. I have seen over time where municipalities sometimes use the professional services exception. That's not exactly accurate, but more and more the trend has been to use some kind of a competitive process. So I'm sure that a lot of you are starting to see in places where maybe you were appointed in the past there is now some sort of RFP or RFQ, which generally would satisfy the fair and open process. So in short, and this is another good slide to keep as a quick reference, particularly if you have to explain things internally within your company, if you get pushback, or they ask why they should really care about where they're making political contributions. In short, pay to play laws seek to prevent businesses, including some individuals, from making or soliciting certain political contributions, which is known as the pay, if they have been awarded or are seeking government contracts, which is generally thought of as the play. So that's the general overview of what does the term pay to play mean? And if you have to explain it to other people within your companies, I think that this slide up there right now is a helpful way to really set the stage where it's you're not too bogged down in the details. So in terms of pay to play restrictions and the Election Transparency Act, what you need to keep in mind is that reportable contributions to candidates are still relevant for determining eligibility for contracts. Contributions to political party committees and legislative leadership committees are no longer relevant for determining eligibility for contracts. There is an exception for state redevelopment agreements. I'm not really talking about that because I think for this audience, I don't see that really being relevant to you, but if it potentially is, please feel to reach out after the program. So for those who have been monitoring pay to play laws for decades and advising within your companies what people can and cannot give, you're going to know for a long time, you probably told people, stay away from party committee contributions. Now it's almost the opposite. Giving to a party committee is a very safe place to give. So I feel like that's been a little bit of a change and a shift. But you still, as I said, need to be very careful when contributions are being made to candidates. If a prohibited contribution is made, a refund may cure the violation. At the executive branch level, it has to be requested in writing and received within 30 days. There is a blackout period within 60 days of a gubernatorial primary or general, where if a contribution more than 200 is made to a gubernatorial candidate, you can't get it back. And that could be a problem with respect to eligibility for state executive branch contracts. At the county and municipal level, a refund must be requested in writing and received within 60 days. That's still the same as it was prior to the enactment of the ETA. Contributions to political action committees, such as the New Jersey Professional Insurance Agents PAC, are still relevant for disclosure purposes. So on your pre-contract disclosure forms, on your annual disclosure, but these contributions will not jeopardize eligibility for government contracting opportunities. So that has not changed either. Now, I think everybody was hoping that with the ETA that we would that finally have one set of pay to play laws with one set of definitions from the executive branch level down to the local level. That did not happen. Um, basically, if you, going back just slightly to the history of pay to play laws, you know, there was a statute that was signed into law in 2004 that was not expected to take effect until 2006. That statute was supposed to cover pay to play restrictions in New Jersey from the executive branch level down to the local level. Then what happened, you know, I said there was that two year window. It was passed in 2004. Effective date was January 1st, 2006. Governor McGreevy res resigned from office. He signed Executive Order 134 into effect in October of 2004, 
which ultimately those provisions were adopted by a statute, which is chapter 51. And it's really just a highly technical, longer way of saying that from that moment on, we had one set of rules that applied at the executive branch level and one set at the local level. The ETA didn't quite create a level playing field. And as you're going to see, we are still dealing with some different definitions under state law. So at the executive branch level, eligibility for non-fair and open appointed contracts, and that could be with the state of New Jersey, any of its independent authorities or departments. I know for this group participating today, you might be interested, you know, the Turnpike Authority, NJ Transit, University Hospital, Rutgers, you know, those are all entities that may have needs and be looking for your services. Those are all state entities. So if you would like to remain eligible for those opportunities and a competitive process is not used, which I have to say is very rare, the state just about always uses some sort of competitive process, you need to be careful about covered contributors making a contribution greater than $200 per election to a gubernatorial candidate. And as you will see, covered contributors include the vendor business entity, so that's the company that's actually submitting the proposal, the 10% or greater owners, if you're organized as a corporation, any officers of the corporation, any equity members, if you're organized as an LLC or LLP, any PAC or subsidiary that's directly or indirectly controlled by the vendor business entity, and the spouse, civil union partner, or resident child of any individual listed above. And this look back period ranges from 18 months to five and a half years. So if one of these covered people contributes more than $200 to a gubernatorial candidate, depending on the timing of it, you could find yourself sitting on the sidelines and ineligible for contracting opportunities that are non-fair and open with the state for up to five and a half years. So this was a bit scarier prior to the Election Transparency Act because there was no fair and open exception but it's still something you need to pay attention to, you know, just depending on what your contracting goals are and how those contracts are awarded. Then it's gonna get a lot easier from here on out in terms of definitions and eligibility. So when you're dealing with county contracts, we're focused on eligibility for non-fair and open or appointed contracts, which may be jeopardized when a reportable contribution so again, that's a contribution greater than $200 per election is made by a covered contributor to a county candidate committee. And covered contributors, as you can see, include the vendor business entity and your greater than 10% owner. So that's pretty easy. We're not concerned with your officers, unless of course they also happen to be greater than 10% owners. We're not concerned about spouses and subsidiaries and resident children and the look back period is 12 months. So really what you wanna be thinking about is if you currently hold or would like to remain eligible for a non-fair and open contract with a particular county, you wanna make sure that your company and any 10% greater owners stay away from contributing more than $200 per election to the county commissioners, county sheriff, county clerk, county executive. And at the municipal level, the rules are the same as they are at the county level. We're just focused on contributions to municipal candidate committees. And again, for non-fair and open appointed contracts and no contribution greater than 200 by a covered individual to a candidate for or holder of municipal office in that particular municipality. And again, the look back period is 12 months. I'm going to be talking about pre-contract pay-to-play certification forms next, but I just want to stop for a moment to see if there are any questions so far. We actually did get a question. Um, yeah. So the question is, is a prohibited contribution one in excess of the limits prescribed in the ETA? Yes, a prohibited contribution would be in excess of, it's not the limits prescribed in the ETA, it would be the reportable threshold. So a prohibited contribution would be a contribution in excess of the $200 reportable threshold. The new limits prescribed in the ETA were just changes to New Jersey's traditional campaign finance laws. So 
we have the municipal slide up here. If the business entity or a greater than 10% owner contributed $500 to a candidate for mayor in a municipality where you hold a contract, that $500 contribution is in full compliance with traditional campaign finance laws. But if you hold a contract with that municipality that was not awarded through some kind of a competitive process, you will have made a contribution in violation of the pay to play limits and that contract could be in jeopardy. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So moving on. So pre-contract pay to play certification forms. So for those of you who do a lot of work with government entities or maybe just a little, you know as part of an RFP or RFQ packet or sometimes just part of your contract award, you will get a packet of forms that you need to complete. There are usually pay to play forms that are included as part of that packet. There is a business entity certification form, which is required in connection with a non-fair and open contract. And in those situations, you would need to certify that no reportable contributions have been made by a covered contributor, as previously noted, depending on whether you're contracting at the state, county, or municipal level, to a covered candidate during the relevant time periods. So the look back is going to be 12 months for county and municipal contracts, 18 months to five and a half years for executive branch contracts. And at the state level, there's also an executive branch chapter 51 EO333 form that also requires you to disclose reportable contributions to PACs that you made within the past four years. Now, in addition to having to complete one of these certification forms, which are generally required when a contract is awarded pursuant to a process that's not competitive, you may also be asked to complete pay-to-play disclosure forms. These pay-to-play disclosure forms generally apply on a pre-contract basis and then an annual basis, which is the disclosure that is coming up really and is due April 1st this year. When you're dealing with the pre-contract and form BE, which is the annual disclosure forms, you have a much larger group of covered contributors. As you can see, you have to disclose contributions by the vendor business entity. So if you have more than one company as part of your corporate family, and let's just say you have five companies that are part of your corporate family, and three of those hold government contracts in their own name under their own EIN number, you are going to, when you file the annual disclosure, have to file a disclosure potentially on behalf of each of those companies. You then look at the vendor business entity and you also have to disclose contributions by any subsidiaries directly or indirectly controlled by that vendor business entity, by a PAC directly or indirectly controlled by that vendor business entity, by 10% or greater owners of a corporation, any equity owner, if it's a professional corporation, equity partners and members of a partnership or LLC, officers, directors, and spouses of any individual in a category listed above. So you can see for disclosure purposes, you do have a broader group of entities and individuals that you need to survey. And I'll talk about some strategies for compliance later on. And generally, Unless one of these individuals is otherwise covered by what I generally think of as the pay to play prohibition laws, a contribution by them is not going to jeopardize eligibility. This is especially true with your directors, unless they happen to be an officer or a 10% or greater owner. But you need to figure out how you're going to get all of this relevant information from all of these people to make sure that you have accurate disclosure and certification forms. So when you're dealing with the pay to play pre-contract disclosure, it's generally, you've, you've seen it, it's a chapter 271 pre-contract disclosure form. It's required in connection with a no bid, non-fair and open contract, and is generally required 10 days before award. If you are required to fill out one of these forms, you must disclose reportable contributions by a covered contributor made within the past 12 months to a candidate committee. And that's going to vary depending on where you're seeking a contract. It's generally, you focus on the county in which 
the particular municipality, if it's a municipal contract, is located. It ties back to the legislative district. So if, for example, I'm entering into a contract in Newark, I would have to disclose reportable contributions to any candidate committees in Newark, any candidates for other municipalities located within Essex County, any Essex County candidate committees, and then to members of the legislature that represent Newark. So obviously, if I'm contracting with TNAC in Bergen County, my candidate committee contributions are going to look different. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind. You do have to disclose reportable contributions to political committees. These are not party committees. They're typically committees that are formed for ballot referendum, like other issues where they're formed in connection with one particular election and then continuing political committees, which are New Jersey's version of a PAC. You no longer need to disclose contributions that are reportable to political party committees or legislative leadership committees. So that's become a little bit easier, you know, in terms of these pre-contract disclosures. Then there's the Business Entity Annual Disclosure, Form BE. Um, that is a form that's filed electronically with ELAC, generally by March 30th of each year, this year, March 30th is on a Saturday, so the filing deadline is Monday, April 1st. This filing is required for a for-profit business entity that received payments totaling 50000 or more in the aggregate as a result of government contracts during the preceding year. So I was talking with a client the other day trying to figure out if they had this disclosure obligation, and they said to me, so the 50000 is the gatekeeper which I thought was just a great way of phasing it. So if you're sitting here thinking, we do business with government, are we gonna have to file this form? There's still confusion all these years later, you know, that I see over whether this filing is required. So the starting point is always, did you receive payments totaling 50,000 or more in the aggregate as a result of the contracts or agreements you had with government entities in New Jersey? If the answer to that question is no, you're done you do not have a Form BE filing obligation for the 2023 calendar year. If you answer yes to that question, the next question is whether you have to file a detailed disclosure or a short form disclosure. If you exceed that $50,000 threshold and then you survey, you look at your company records, you survey your directors, your officers, your principals, their spouses, and not one of those people or entities has made a reportable contribution during the 2023 calendar year, you have to file a short form BE, which is basically a one page filing where you say we receive payments of 50,000 or more, we have no contributions to report and you're done. It's a very simple filing. If even one covered individual or entity made a reportable contribution during 2023, you then will need to file the long form BE, which requires you to disclose contract information and contribution information. So we're now, it's March 14th, this filing is due April 1st. You still have a decent amount of time to figure out where you stand, what your filing obligation is, and to prepare your filing, particularly if you need to do a long form or detailed filing. If it turns out you need to do the long form BE, you are going to need to disclose reportable contributions by your covered contributors to candidate committees, continuing political committees, and political committees. You are no longer required to disclose reportable contributions to political party committees or legislative leadership committees. So if you survey all relevant people and you see the only contributions that were made in 2023, were contributions that were reportable to county, state, or municipal party committees, you would still then only have to file the short form. So that's really just to show the differences and what your filings may look like. It sounds like a lot of words, and I know that, and it's a lot of layers to go through. But if you sort of just start with the question of, did we hit the 50,000 threshold? And then it's almost like a choose your own adventure it becomes pretty easy to navigate whether you have to do a detailed filing or not. Now, before I see if there are any additional questions regarding the ELAC Business Entity Annual Disclosure, 
I will say that with the ETA, the reportable threshold changed from 300 to 200 midway through the 2023 calendar year. So when you're doing a filing, if you have to do the long form filing for the 2023 calendar year, any contribution between January 1st and June 30th that's over $300 is reportable. Then once you get to July 1st through the end of the year, anything over 200 is reportable. If you don't care and you just want to use a $200 reportable threshold for the whole year, you could certainly do that. But you want to pay attention to this as well, because if you generally have made an effort to keep contributions non-reportable by the company itself or covered individuals, don't get tripped up if all of a sudden you see you know, a contribution earlier in the year that was, you know, 250, if it wasn't made after July 1st, it's not subject to disclosure. So I'll pause there too, just to see, Brad, I don't know if there are any other questions. We actually have two. So the first one okay. is, <clears throat> if no RFP or RFQ, then is it um, non-fair and open? Generally, yes. If there's no RFP, no RFQ, that would generally be considered a non-fair and open contract because they didn't use any type of competitive process. Perfect. And the, uh, the second question is, what is a legislative leadership committee? So a legislative leadership committee are basically like the leadership pack. So if you've seen them, it's the Senate Democratic majority, the Senate Republican majority, the Democratic, um, it's like the campaign committee for the legislature and the Republican side and the Democratic side. So they're basically almost like larger political action committees that are connected to the leaders in the Senate and the Assembly. There are four of them in the state of New Jersey, two on the Republican side, two on the Democrat, one for Senate on each side and one for Assembly on each side. Perfect. See, I think we just got one more question in. Okay, one more question just came in. Yep. Oh my goodness, now they really are coming on. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what if a renewal of the previous contract and there's no RFP, RFQ for that year? If it's a renewal of a previous contract, I would look to see how the previous contract was awarded. If it, the previous contract, they used a competitive process and the previous contract had a term in it allowing for that renewal, I would treat that as fair and open. If the previous contract was non-competitive and if the previous contract had no term at all in it, allowing for a renewal, then you would potentially have to treat that as non-fair and open. So I'd go back to the initial contract and see how it's described and whether there's a renewal provision in there. Great. And the next question, uh, if contributions are made to an individual candidate and reportable on Form BE, do I still have to include the party contributions on Form BE? So that's a great question. And the answer is no. If party political party committee contributions no longer need to be disclosed on the Form BE or on the pre-contract disclosures. So even if you have reportable contributions to candidate committees, you still do not have to disclose reportable contributions to party committees. So your Form BE, you're really just going to be looking for reportable contributions to candidate committees, continuing political committees, you know, or PACs, and then any political committee, which would generally, like I said, be a ballot referendum committee. You can ignore your political party committee contributions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are the questions that we have, right? Oh, is the limit still 17500 Yes, in terms of the award of a contract. That's right. That's the threshold if a, that you would use. So those numbers have not changed, even though bid thresholds have gone up. So if a government entity, state, county, or municipality awards a contract with a value greater than 17500 and does not use some sort of a competitive process, then you are focused on reduced pay-to-play limits. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Those are the questions yeah. we have for right now. Okay. Now, moving on, I did mention at the beginning that the Election Transparency Act also really changed the law in New Jersey with respect to independent expenditure activity. I don't think this is really going to impact this group in terms of I don't anticipate you're all going to go out and start making independent expenditures, but you may be asked to contribute to or support groups or entities that are engaged in independent expenditures. 
So an independent expenditure is an expenditure that promotes the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate. It contains express advocacy, or they say the functional equivalent thereof, where you're basically a reasonable person reading the ad, seeing the ad, would draw no other conclusion than the ad is promoting one candidate or is against another. And an independent expenditure cannot be coordinated with a candidate or their agents. And the reason for this is because independent expenditure committees may receive unlimited amounts of money. Money coming in is not subject to campaign finance limits. And independent expenditure committees or individuals or companies that are making independent expenditures are allowed to spend unlimited amounts of money on their independent expenditures. So independent groups have received a lot of attention in recent years because of the unlimited amounts of money that may be raised and spent. I will say like one great myth is that people think that contributions to independent expenditure committees are not subject to disclosure. That is not true. If you're giving to an independent expenditure committee, the committee is still required to disclose their donors. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, what the Election Transparency Act did was it expanded independent expenditure disclosure and reporting requirements. Under the law, any political organization, a trade association, a social welfare organization, which is generally a 501c4, that spends more than $7,500 in the aggregate per election on independent expenditures now falls within the definition of an independent expenditure committee and is required to register with the Election Law Enforcement Commission, file regular reports with ELAC, and disclose all contributions received by that organization in excess of $17,500 for the purpose of making independent expenditures. Now, we're waiting for the regulatory process. I think there's a lot that needs to play out here because I think the law, in some ways, there's wording in it where it seems like there could be potential carve-outs, but we have to see how ELEC ends up applying it. So the bottom line here is when you're writing a check to a political organization, a trade association, or a social welfare organization, it's important to know whether they engage in independent expenditure activity. Obviously, you know, the professional insurance agents, you, you guys are a trade association. You know, as far as I know, Brad, you have no plans to make independent expenditures. But if you decided as a trade association, you were going to run independent expenditures, you know, and really advocate for or against particular candidates, there is an argument under this new law that anyone who gave you more than $7,500 for the purpose of making those independent expenditures would potentially be subject to reporting on reports with ELAC and the trade association would have to register. So this is one area where I'm really waiting for it to play out. I think everybody is. I think the key takeaway here is don't worry about it too much. And you're going to hear me say this later, but be an informed consumer you know, if you're asked to give to a C4, if you're asked to give to a political organization, or even when you're involved in a trade association, you know, and you're paying your dues or you're making other donations, just ask, you know, are you involved in independent expenditures? Do you have any plans to be? And if the organization does, and you would rather not show up on an ELAC report, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not going to jeopardize your eligibility for government contracts. It's just a change in the law. You would have two choices. You could either make sure, you know, that the total amount you give is less than the 7,500, or you can let the organization where your money is going know, I'm giving you this check, I'm making this contribution or donation to you, but I don't want it being used for independent expenditure activity. So that's a just, I think something just keep in the back of your mind. I don't think you really have to think about it too much, but know it's there and pay attention to it as you're being solicited for contributions. So I don't know if there are any questions about that before I move on. Uh, no questions at this time. Okay, thanks, Brad. Of course. All right, so contributions to the NJPIA PAC. So an individual corporation, labor union, or another PAC may contribute up to $14,400 per calendar year to the NJPIA PAC. 
This is a change under the previous law that limit was $7,200 per calendar year. So that's one change where now there's an ability to contribute more to trade association PACs and really all other PACs in New Jersey, which when it comes to a trade association PAC, that can be helpful because it will enable the trade association PAC to get more involved with elections. If a contribution is drawn upon a partnership or limited liability company account, under New Jersey law, that contribution needs to be attributable to individual partners or members and should be signed, should be, I'm sorry, I should say, accompanied by a signed attribution letter. This is true whether you're contributing to the PAC or any other New Jersey political recipient. If your company is organized as a partnership or limited liability company, under New Jersey campaign finance law, you may not contribute as an entity. The contributions need to be attributed to individual equity partners or members and are treated as an individual contribution by that individual or those, in, or those individuals. Um, all contributions must be voluntary. A contribution must never be reimbursed in any way, shape, or form. This would include providing additional increments of salary to people with the understanding they'll use that to make political contributions, bonuses with the understanding they'll be used to make political contributions, or even something as simple as, you know, somebody's really not thinking about it and they write a political contribution check, maybe they went to a fundraiser and they submit it for reimbursement on their expense report. So that's one key thing you want to keep in mind and you wanna make clear to the extent that you're potentially asking individuals within your company whether they are interested in participating politically on an individual basis. Again, you want it to be voluntary. Nobody should feel pressured to give and nobody can seek reimbursement or be reimbursed. Contributions to the NJPIA PAC are not aggregated with contributions to other trade association or business and industry PACs. So you can support as many PACs as you would like at the $14,400 per calendar year level. Now, when you're thinking about contributions to the NJPIA PAC and pay to play laws, a few things you need to keep in mind. Any contribution that's greater than $200 per calendar year is reportable by the PAC on its regular ELEC reports. And you as the vendor business entity would be required to disclose any contribution greater than $200 per calendar year on your pay to play pre-contract disclosures or your annual disclosure. Contributions to the NJPIA PAC are not subject to pay to play restrictions. So they are subject to disclosure requirements, but a contribution to the PAC is not going to jeopardize your eligibility for government contracting opportunities. And this statement, you know, and that conclusion really dates back to the beginning of pay to play laws when there was a lot of confusion and ELEC has issued several advisory opinions on point, you know, looking at trade association PACs. And if you think about it, you know, you're all here today, you're members of the Professional Insurance Agents Association of New Jersey, but you may be competing against one another for government contracts or other opportunities. So if you remember back at the beginning of the program, you know, I talked about the fact that pay to play laws were generally viewed as laws that were put into effect so that government contracts are awarded to those who are the most qualified, sometimes with the best price and experience. You know, they have to be awarded in the best interest of the taxpayers, not to the highest contributor. And before pay to play laws went into effect, there was criticism because a lot of contracts at the local level, whether they were for attorneys, architects, engineers, insurance agents, were not always being put out to public bid. So there was a thought or a sentiment that sometimes counties or municipalities were simply awarding contracts to those who wrote the biggest checks to their political committees, not necessarily the most qualified. So that's how the pay to play laws came into effect. So when you take a trade association and all of you that are part of a trade association, you really diminish that concern about undue influence on the government procurement process through political activity. So giving to a trade association PAC is honestly still one of the safest places that you can contribute. Contributions to NJPIA PAC or any other political contribution 
are not tax deductible. So it's not like a charitable contribution or sometimes if you donate to a trade association, you can sometimes deduct that as a business expense. When it's a political contribution, it is not tax deductible. I'm going to start the wrap up portion of the program, but I'll just stop there too to see if there are any additional questions. Uh, not at this time. Okay. So political giving in 2024 and beyond. So as we approach the 2024 primary and beyond that, you are likely, if you have not already, to receive numerous requests for political giving. I don't think it's any great mystery that we're living in a time where we have a lot of important issues facing our state and the country. We have polarizing political figures and issues. We now, with the Election Transparency Act, have this increase in traditional contribution limits. At the same time, we have the rolling back of pay to play restrictions and a reduction in the reportable threshold. So it sort of is like this perfect storm in terms of people becoming politically active or politically active in ways they haven't before. And I think this is only likely to increase as we head further into the 2025 gubernatorial election we see there are already a large number of candidates who have declared it used to be you know that people would normally declare in January of a gubernatorial election year. I think we all know the last few cycles that has not been the case and this will be the first gubernatorial election I believe since the one in 2005 where we don't have stringent pay to play restrictions in effect. So that's going to be interesting too, to see how that plays out because historically, almost everybody was scared to make a reportable contribution to a gubernatorial candidate. That's really not the case anymore because there's now the fair and open exception at the executive branch level. So as we are heading further along into election season, you may be bombarded with requests. You may be uncertain of what impact a specific contribution may have on your eligibility for government contracts, your reputation, your disclosure obligations. What I always tell all clients is take your time to conduct your own due diligence. Political giving is not an emergency. I know sometimes it feels like this last minute thing and you're being bombarded with requests and you know, hurry up, this event is happening tonight. A political recipient will always take your money after an event. And you really need to take a step back and think about and discuss as a company, what are your goals? You know, obviously you wanna remain eligible for government contracting opportunities. So that's clear in terms of determining whether the company or an individual can make a reportable contribution. You want to be thinking about your disclosure obligations, you know, filling out the pay to play pre-contract or annual disclosure forms. It's not rocket science, but it certainly takes some time, takes some effort. You need to have good systems in place. Sometimes it's easier to keep all contributions non-reportable and just be able to say none, but you may not feel like that's an option. And then there's your reputation. I think when the Election Transparency Act first went into effect, you know, a lot of people thought, well, this is great. You know, now I can really give what I want and I don't have to worry as much. And then I think people sort of took a step back. And I've had a lot of clients say to me, this has almost made things more challenging. I don't have to navigate through local pay to play ordinances. But now that I'm able to give more, I have to think about whether I really want to give more. Do I want to be showing up on ELEC reports? Do I want to be showing up in public databases? How is it going to look even if my you know, contract is awarded through a competitive process and every officer of my company is giving the max to you know, the office holders in that particular municipality? So these are all things that you need to think about. You know, it's really not one size fits all. I've been doing this for a while, and I often think back to three different examples clients have given me over the years. You know, I'll never forget, I had one client when I work with them in this space who basically said to me, we don't even want to be standing on a line looking over. We want to understand the gray. We want to understand the risks. And we're going to make our decisions based on them. I had another client around the same time who basically said to me, as long as we're within the four corners of the law, we really don't care what's written about us, what's said about us. We just want to be able to demonstrate if asked that we are in compliance with the law. 
And then I remember around that same time meeting a company that was interested in retaining my services who basically had the mentality of not everybody who run, runs a red light gets caught. You know, needless to say, that didn't work out too well, you know, for either of us, but those just show you the different spectrum. So you have to decide kind of where are you? What is your tolerance for risk? And that really will play into the different procedures you put in place and some of your different strategies for compliance. So as we're wrapping up, you know, when you're thinking about next steps, here's what I recommend. You want to review or develop, if you don't have one, company policies and procedures for political activity compliance. You don't necessarily need a 20 page document. You know, this really is going to depend on the size of your organization, how many people are politically active and what you think will work best for you. You don't wanna make it so burdensome that it's gonna become very difficult to follow. But at the same time, you do want something that's workable and manageable. So you feel like you have a handle on what's going on and you don't end up with surprises in terms of contributions people have made. As you're doing this, you wanna review and evaluate your government contracting goals. Where do you currently hold contracts? How were those contracts awarded? Where do you think you might be interested in contracting within the next year, the next couple of years, you know, knowing you're not going to be able to predict everything? You need to track company contributions and contributions by covered individuals. Sometimes this gets tricky and people may say, what I choose to give politically is my business. Why are you asking me about this? Well, to the extent that an individual's contributions may jeopardize your eligibility for a government contract or be subject to disclosure, you need to have that information. And if you're the individual within your company that's signing these disclosure and certification forms, you obviously want to make sure that you're submitting accurate information to the government. You want to evaluate potential appearance concerns. And as I talked about just a little bit earlier, even if a contribution is within applicable limits, it still may carry risk. You may have submitted a proposal for a fair and open contract, and maybe the municipality is going to be voting on that in a week. Maybe you get an invitation today for a big fundraiser, you know, for the slate of candidates in that particular municipality. There is nothing wrong if the, if the municipality is using a fair and open process to contribute up to those full campaign finance limits. But you may want to think, well, how is that going to look if the week before we're being considered for a contract, we make many large contributions? You want to train and retrain relevant people. You know, you want to remember that just because everyone is trained today doesn't mean that everyone will still be trained tomorrow. People may come and go. People may change positions within a company. And like I said, I've been doing this for a while now. I've worked with a lot of companies and clients on policies. But I think the takeaway there is it's obviously good to have a written policy that's in place that people can refer back to, but we're all inundated with so much information and so many documents and policies that having conversations and keeping this at the forefront of people's minds is always very important. You want to be an informed consumer. I mentioned this before. Before any contribution check is written, whether that's by the company or by a covered individual, you want to make sure you understand the traditional campaign finance limits. Are you dealing with reduced pay to play limits? Who is a cover contributor? If this person goes ahead and makes this contribution, will it have repercussions for the company? You also want to understand the type of recipient committee to which you're writing your check. As you're doing all this, remember the NJPIA PAC is a safe place to contribute. So that's always a very nice option in terms of knowing you're contributing to a trade association PAC that's set up the right way, that files its reports and does things responsibly. So I do want to you know, leave you with that point. And the last thing I'll say is you're thinking about this, it's always easier to send a check or make a contribution a day later, two days later. But once that check or contribution leaves your hands, it's a lot harder to get it back if you realize that you have an issue. So, you know, I hope that you can take some of this back with you, you know, start to figure out what works best for your company. I think the hardest part about all of this is we're dealing with people and we know human beings are never perfect. But when you have 
a compliance program in place and open dialogue. I've also found that if a person makes a mistake, cuts a check that they shouldn't, they feel more comfortable coming forward. And then there's still time to navigate and potentially correct that mistake. Whereas if everyone's just sticking their head in the sand, maybe nobody will find out and it won't be an issue, but chances are it will. And then it's gonna become a lot harder to deal with because you could be on the heels of learning you're not eligible for a government contract. So now I'll see if there are any other questions that anybody has. Uh, we had one additional question come in. Uh, sure. so non fair and open donation in excess of $200 is non fair and open? So if you make a contribution, if you have a non fair and open contract or want to remain eligible for a non fair and open contract, you may not contribute more than $200 to a candidate in that particular municipality or county at the state level. So if you wanna preserve eligibility for non-fair and open contracting opportunities, you wanna keep the contributions to $200 or less. Awesome, thank you. Uh, no questions, but just a, a thank you uh, to you for a great webinar. That was a comment from an attendee, not just from me. Uh, that is also a comment from me as well. Well, you're welcome. You know, thank you so much for joining me. I know I threw a lot of information out there. Like I said, you know, Brad, you guys can feel free to distribute this PowerPoint. And, you know, here is my contact information. And I was kindly referred to all of you by Carol Kapp, who I know couldn't be here today because she is at the State House. But, you know, anyone that she works with, happy to definitely answer any follow up questions that you may have. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us. This was great, honestly. Um, really, really appreciate the time, and I'm sure I speak for everybody here as well. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, this session has been recorded. Um, if We'll send the link out after this, uh, as well as the slides, um, if you are interested in those. If you have any other questions, feel free to, to reach out to PIA, and we can certainly direct them to Rebecca. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.